Hi, my name is Mary Allen, and I'm going to talk to you today about the specifics of the GATK pipeline that I used. I say that I used because I did this more than a year ago, so some of the names of the programs may have changed, but at least the overall ideas will be here and some specific tips relating to GATK. So the first thing you're going to do when you get your reads is going to be, like we talked about in class before, quality control and trimming. But after that, you need to map. And I'm talking about mapping again because mapping has a couple extra flags that you need to use if you're going to use GATK. And they're here in red. Um, they are all RG, which stands for read group. And those flags help to identify for your BAM file the different sequencings you've done of the same person. So uh, RGID is going to be something that is unique to every sequencing reaction you're going to be looking at. Uh, the RGPL will be the platform you used, which in my case was Illumina. The PU uh, is specific to the machine. And then SM is the sample. So in this instance, um, I have a sample that I have made up a name for, Elizabeth. And all of, I'm going to have to malt, map seven different sequencing reactions of Elizabeth, but they'll all be named the sample name Elizabeth so that the computer knows they're the same thing. So the read groups are, like I said, what you need to specify as flags when you map, whether you map using Bowtie or BWA, like GATK recommends. Make sure the read groups are in there because downstream several of the pipelines will be using them. When you do do DNA sequencing, it is very important to do multiple lanes of sequencing. There's a couple reasons for this, and we'll go over them in a minute. But just to remind you what a lane is, this is a flow cell, uh, which is what is being used to sequence on almost all of the Illumina platforms. And on the flow cell, there are a number of lanes, depending on which machine you're using. The one I use most often has eight lanes, but another one I use has two lanes. Uh, but it's important to know not only how which flow cell your sample went on to, but how many lanes of that flow cell your sample went on to, so that you can mark in the read groups uh, which lane it is as a separate identifier. So I am going to go over a bunch of GA, uh, Java commands for using GATK. But I want to note that I have added two lines at the beginning right after the Java, Java every time. There's this line, um, which tells Java what temp directory to use. And that's very important because GATK was written in a way in which it makes up temporary file names and then erases those files after it's done doing whatever it does. But sometimes it, because you're running so many jobs at once, it will make up the same temp file name for two different files, and that kills the processes. So in order to get around this, I have set my temp directory to a directory in which I have put the slurm job ID as part of the directory name. And in that way, the temp IDs can never collide if I'm running more than one slurm job at once. The other thing I've set is this right here, which tells Java to never use more than four threads. Java is a very greedy program. It likes to use as many threads as it can get its hands on. Uh, and of course, on a system where you're sharing on a cluster, you don't want it to take over more threads than it's supposed to. So this is sort of like putting the brakes on Java so that it can't use more threads than, you're, than it's supposed to be using. In this instance, I've set it to four, but whatever you set it to, you should set your uh, slurm part of the script and this part of the script to the same number of threads. Threading is a little complicated in GATK because we're going to go through several subprograms, and the different subprograms actually use different numbers of threads, at least the number of threads that are suggested is different. So I put two websites here that I found really useful, uh, one of which tells you the number of threads it suggests for each of the subparts you're going to be running. And then the other one, which is that some of the programs that use threading have to have extra options that give it the number of threading or the number of threads you're giving it. Beyond this, you have to put something into a couple of the subprograms. Uh, generally, those are NT and NT. CT or NTC, 
but you can read about it on these two websites when you go to actually run your commands. And do be aware, GATK has been very clear that threading can give you different results than running on a single thread can. Okay, so the first thing that you want to do is to, after mapping, is to merge all of the different lanes together. So this is why you had to use those RG flags when mapping, because once you merge them together, all of the reads will then be in one very big BAM file. Uh, which is useful when you're trying to decide what's a real SNP, but the computer has to be able to tell the lanes apart because if there was an error in one of the lanes and not all of the lanes, it has to know which of those it came from. So we merge using a command called merge SAM files. Uh, the way that you merge in the newer version is slightly different from this, but the name of the command is still merge SAM files. Uh, and you give it all the input files and one output file to put things into. And again, these are the lines I talked about I always put into my JavaScripts. The temp directory, temp directory pointing to a directory I've built with the Slurm job ID in it, and then uh, the number of threads I am limiting Java to. In this case, it was 16. Another concern we have to worry about is PCR duplicates. It used to be that we just removed duplicates. So if we saw a read in there more than once, we just threw it away because we would assume it was a PCR duplication. Just because you see a read more than once does not mean it's a PCR duplication. And so the newer version of GTK does not remove them, but marks them as duplicates. So in order to mark as duplicates, you have to have a sorted BAM file. And now that you've merged it, it is no longer sorted. So you sort the merge and then you mark the duplicates using a command called mark duplicates. And again, it just takes, or it just needs an input file, an output BAM file, and then a metrics file. And in that metrics file will be all the information about how many duplicates there are. There actually is a graphing program that will automatically graph these metric uh, outputs. So the next problem you run into uh, when trying to determine if something is a real SNP is alignment issues. So you can actually have the same exact read aligned multiple different ways because when the computer goes to align it, it might decide that since there is a deletion here, it should put the hole right here or it might put the hole slightly off shifted from that if the nucleotides on either side of the deletion could go either place. And so what indel realignment does for you is not necessarily in, align things in the right way, but align things in a consistent way so that you're not miscalling bases simply because you don't have all your reads aligned similarly. So it's done in two different steps. First of all, you create what is called a target intervals file by taking in your BAM file and a bunch of known sites that are uh, real SNPs that they have in the human genome and that creates a table that is called target intervals and then you have to feed your BAM file and your known sites back into the al realigner with the target intervals and then it create a new BAM so it really is two different steps um, so the first step is called realigner target creator the thing I will note in purple is the known file. So GATK is best used on model organisms and mainly human because there are so many known SNPs. That does not mean you can't use it on other organisms, but when you go to do things like realigner, you can't give it known SNPs because there are no known SNPs. So when you run these programs for human, it will recommend to you which known SNP files you should be using. And you, the other thing you do that I thought was very interesting about the realigner is that to create your target list, you're actually going to create a target list from all of your BAMs, which will make targets across all the BAMs. And then step two will be done on each individual BAM file using the same input of target regions to realign. And that just makes all your files much more consistent with each other. So the next step is to deal with the quality score issues you see. 
now that we've mapped our reads, we have the original quality scores for the reads, but you can tell that not every quality score is what it should be based on the fact that some things don't map well at all and some map really well. And so what the quality score realignment is, is it is looking at a bunch of parameters like the quality score at every position, the quality score at every dinucleotide, and saying these should be consistent with each other. When they are different, let's readjust the quality scores so that all the lanes have the same quality score and all the bases have the same quality score. And this just makes for more accurate quality scores for your reads, which is helpful in determining if you've got a real SNP or a false SNP. So this is again in two steps like the other one. There's the base recalibrator, which creates the table of positions that might be important to look at or uh, metrics for the recalibration machinery. And after you've created that table, then you're going to pass that table on to something that then calls those positions um, and recalibrates them and creates a new BAM file. That's what this is doing. It is Re using those things you called before, which are called a, the table you made, which is called a BQSR, to actually recalibrate all the FOSQ quality scores. So now we have made it through all of the first panel over here. We have realigned, we have base recalibrated, we are ready to start variant calling, and we variant calls, kind of. So we start by using haplotype caller. Haplotype caller can output the variance that it that it sees. However, um, I say kind of because if you're going to combine multiple variants from different people, you actually output it as a VCF or GVCF instead of a VCF. So a VCF is the variant file format, but a GVCF just has it in a different order so that it is easier to combine multiple people downstream. Again, in purple, I have known variants that are being used again. The rest of these flags, GATK just recommends for you, and you follow the parameters that they are recommending. So now we make a VCF by combining the GVCFs of a bunch of different people. In this case, I have a family of three people, a dad, a mom, and a daughter, and I'm going to take all of their GVCF files and combine them into a single VCF file using a program called Genotype GVCFs. Okay, so now I have a VCF file. VCF files look a little bit like this. They have lots of information at the top under some hashtags about what you were running and how you were getting the information you got, what chromosomes there are, and then at the bottom it's all the actual variants. So chromosome, start position, if there is a label for it in a database, it will then get a label that's called an RS label. Um, it then gives you the reference genome and the nucleotide that's being called now. It gives you more information like the number of reads and whether or not they think it's homozygous or heterozygous over in the end of this file that I'm not showing you. So this is fine to look at, but it's a little bit overwhelming and not so useful. So what's more fun is that you can pull a VCF file into IGV, which is right here, and you can flip through it just like we did the bed file. So if you click on it and highlight it and use Control F or Control uh, B forward or backwards, it will move through them. Right here I've got a VCF with the three family members in it. So the dad's on top, the child is in the middle, and the mom is on the bottom. And what you see is that here, dad has a SNP that the child and the mom don't have. That's true for all of these. The two colors means it's a heterozygous SNP. If you mouse over it in IGV, it'll actually give you even more information, like how many reads are there, how many of them are A, how many of them are T, how many of them are C or G. Here you have a SNP that is homozygous yet not matching the reference, and it happens to be in both the child and in the father. Sometimes, and not in this screen, but in other screens, you'll get grayed out ones, and those are SNPs in which, yes, it's calling it the VCF, but it doesn't think it's a very quality call, so it will make it gray. 
So we have our SNPs and we have a list of them, but the problem is that we know that this list has false positive in it. Um, that's just due to the technical errors and the other errors you see in sequencing humans. And so what they make you do now is decide how many false positives do you want. So you can choose um, to keep 100% of the calls that you made. That's called a tranche of 100. Uh, or you can choose to drop the 0.01% of the variants that are worse. And so what you end up with is if you call all of them, some percentage of them, maybe 80 or 90 percent, are right and 20 percent are wrong. If you drop that lowest 0.1 percent via score for the VC or for the variant, you then get rid of mostly false positives and a couple true positives. If you drop one percent of your the one percent of your calls that are worst, you've mostly gotten rid of the false positives. However, you've dropped a lot of true positives as well. And then if you use a tranche of 90, you've now got nothing but true positives, but you're all mi also missing a bunch of true positives. So they make you decide on a tranche level or a truth level, and then that is used to output your VCF, your last VCF that you will therefore use. So they recommend four different truth levels depending on your experiment. You have to call those truth levels for the SNPs and the indels separately. So here is, first again, it's the same format as before. We're going to make a table, and then we're going to use the table, or make different files that tell you about the, the sample, and then use those files to recall the VCF. So Variant Recalibrator makes those tables, which are called tranche files and recal files. And then after you've made them, you use Apply Recalibration to take those files in, attach them to your BAM files, so your recall file and your trans file is being attached to your, not your BAM file, sorry, your VCF file. And then that VCF file is then corrected based on the uh, tranche level you have asked for. And you have to tell it whether you're doing this for SNPs or indels. So they recommend doing the recalibration for SNPs and then indels, which is what I did. Um, but I decided to try and look at all the tranche levels because I didn't know which tranche level was the best tranche level for what I was doing. That ends up with a lot of different files. So for every family I was looking at, I ended up with 16 different variant files. The tranche 90 for SNPs, tranche 90 for indels, had nothing but true positives, but there were a lot of true positives that were missing. And then the tranche 100, tranche 100, had all the true positives, but a lot of false positives. My favorite ended up being a tranche of 99.9 .9 for my SNPs and 99 for indels, but that will definitely change uh, depending on your projects. It is a lot of files though because you have to go through each of these VCF files and decide on what looks like it's really calling an accurate level. Um, and what do I mean by decide? They mean actually pull it up at IGV, start looking at it. I've also done PCR in several of those variants. And so when you get to this point, you use IGV, you look through, you try and decide, you know, this is the number of reads that I'm seeing. Yes, that looks like it's really a SNP. Or often my false positives are actually in regions that are clearly um, duplications. Because if you have multiple copies of something in a genome, then it's gonna, it is more likely to look like it's heterozygous because one copy is homozygous reference genome and one is homozygous not reference genome. So I look through by eye, I try and decide which files I think are most accurate, and then I go back by PCR and actually decide if those SNPs are real. Sanger sequencing. So good old-fashioned Sanger sequencing, double check your SNPs, try and decide if you have picked the right level, and that's why they say variant evaluation, does it look good? If not, troubleshoot, rerun possibly the whole pipeline. Um, or use it in the project you're working on. The last thing I'll say is that when I ran this, it was over a year ago, they have now simplified some of this. So um, before you would run things like base recalibration and print reads and haplotype caller on every individual file. 
and now they've optimized it so that you can load it with a lot of different files and it can run base for Calibrator across a bunch of different files. So that's a new option. It is definitely worth doing. It will speed up your results a lot. So do remember that when you run GATK, it is slow, it's tedious. You'll probably have to go back and redo a couple steps once you try them, um, but hopefully it will get you to the snips you're looking for.